Good morning, I'm Jasmine Smothers and I'm the lead pastor here at Atlanta First United Methodist Church in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. It's my joy and my privilege to welcome you to our digital campus today. This is Spring Forward Sunday and the week in which we um, change our time. We lose an hour as we move forward. But it's also the season where even though it's 30 degrees outside here in Atlanta right now, we look forward to spring um, and to the season change and to temperature changes and to all the changes that are to come in this new season. We are continuing our Lenten season called Enough Already. And today we will explore what it means to live in God's timing and not our timing. I know that um, so much of what we do in this life is based on time. And yet God has a different idea of time than we do. So let's lean in together today and see what the Gospel of Luke has to teach us about God's timing over our timing. I also want to invite you this week to find a way to worship, serve, grow, or engage within your context or through the ministry of Atlanta First United Methodist Church. April 5th is Friends at the Front Door. Every first Tuesday, we have the opportunity to serve those who are um, our friends and neighbors, some housed, some underhoused, um, who are in need of toiletries and food and items, uh, clothing items like socks and things to keep them warm, face masks and more. Um, we can only do that because you contribute uh, to Friends at the Front Door. You can either contribute through your time um, or through your gifts. $8 provides a meal, $15 provides a toiletry kit. So we invite you to give generously to this ministry so that we can continue to be uh, partners and neighbors to those in our community. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you. 
As we go to God in prayer this morning, I want to lift up today um, all of those who are on our prayer list. We want to continue to lift up Stephen Moore, um, Mary's son, Douglas, who within a span of a week will um, funeralize his aunt and his uncle. Um, We want to lift up Dallas Terrell, um, Bill Sims' brother, Douglas, who's hospitalized, We want to continue to lift up the war in Ukraine, um, the United Methodist Church, our church leaders, our civic leaders, our government leaders, our private sector leaders. Um, We celebrate the 90th birthday of Ambassador Andrew Young this weekend. And we remember those who have died from COVID over the last two years. We hit the six million deaths worldwide mark this week. And so we remember and go to God in prayer today. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Gracious and loving God, we have come to call on your name, for there is nothing like your name, and there is something about that name, oh God, 
that when we call on you, that we draw near to you, O oh God, and that we know and trust that you are with us, that we are in your presence, and that you are already at work in our lives and in every situation that is going on in the universe, O oh God. You call us to your throne of mercy so that there we find a sweet relief. When we kneel in deep contrition, oh God, you help our unbelief. If we'll trust in your merit, oh God, and if we will seek your face, you will heal our wounded, broken spirits and save us by your grace oh God you are the spring of all our comfort more than life to us whom on earth can we go to beside thee and whom in heaven but thee so God, we come seeking your healing power. We come seeking your comfort, oh God. We come seeking your grace and your mercy, even when we have failed to extend grace and mercy ourselves, oh God. We come expecting that you are already ahead of us in every situation. We come giving thanks that we don't see what you see and that you see what we don't see. Oh God, we come giving thanks that your time is not our time and that our time is not your time. Oh God, we come giving thanks that things that look one way, that have haven't had your last word, oh God, or actually another way because you are God and you are God alone and you don't need our help. Hallelujah. Oh God, forgive us when we have been exclusionary. Oh God, forgive us when we have purposefully done things to separate people from your love, oh God. God, forgive us when we have not been obedient to what you've told us to do and when we have not been obedient to what you have told us not to do, oh God. Forgive us, we pray. And free us, oh God. Free us so that we might be joyfully obedient beings of yours. Remind us, oh God, that you have grown the breath of life into us. Remind us, oh God, that you walk with us and talk with us, that you have never left us, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Remind us, oh God, that you are in all things and that you work things out for our good. They might not feel good, oh God. They might not look good, oh God, and they might not be good, oh God, but you work them out for our good and for this we give you praise Lord grant us peace grant us the peace that passes all understanding and grant us the courage to be the people that you have called us to be to care for our neighbors to be devastated when we see images of war and to go to work to stop the war, oh God. Give us the courage to be the church that you created us to be. And do not pass, pass us by. Thank you for teaching us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. There's a litany in your bulletin for those of you who are in the sanctuary and in the worship guide. And um, a litany, kiddos, is just um, a fancy word for a lot of words where the preacher or the leader says a bunch of words and then you say something back to us, okay? So the congregation is going to say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And I'm going to say all the other words, okay? This, pen, this litany was given to us by our conference, um, our church transition and clinical resource specialist, Reverend Lindsay Geis, who is an incredible social worker and therapist who works with our conference to make sure that our clergy don't lose their minds um, and that our churches don't lose their minds. So it has been two years since COVID-19 was first declared a pandemic and our world halted to a stop. On this two-year anniversary, we light a candle, this Paschal candle, and join in this litany together with those near and far across North Georgia and beyond. We pause and name all those who have contracted COVID-19. Those who have died. And all the funerals that we have missed. We pause and name all the losses we have experienced. The tangible and the intangible. We pause and name the hard choices that we had to make and the parts of life that will never be the same. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pause and mourn everything that stopped over the past two years. We pause and mourn the loss of jobs, loss of dreams, and loss of relationships. We pause and mourn that life will never go back to the before moment and that we are forever changed. Lord, hear our prayer. We pause and express gratitude for all the healthcare workers who work tirelessly to care for people experiencing illness and their families. We pause and express gratitude for the researchers that we work that have worked collaboratively to create a vaccine to help end the pandemic. We pause and express gratitude for the essential workers that stood in harm's way to help us continue to meet our basic needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pause and reflect on all the time we've missed with those we love when we had to be apart. We pause and reflect on all the extra time we had with those in our household. We pause and reflect on how hard it was to crisis school our kids at home, take care of family members away from us, and still maintain our own jobs working from home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pause and honor how tired we still are from managing and simply surviving these past two years. We pause and honor that we made decisions even when we weren't sure what was the right decision. We pause and honor our resiliency even when we haven't felt resilient. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. 
We pause and acknowledge how worn out we are emotionally and physically from navigating this pandemic. We pause and acknowledge how the constant pivoting and uncertainty has forever changed us. We pause and acknowledge all the anger, sadness, and fear we felt over the past two years. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pause and appreciate all the new skills we learned over these past two years. We pause and appreciate the adaptability that emerged within us in our communities. We pause and appreciate that the pandemic granted us some permission to let things go that haven't been serving us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pause and celebrate all the new opportunities we gained from breaking with old ways and routines. We pause and celebrate our newfound longing for community and connection. We pause and celebrate that even when we weren't gathering at the church building, church kept happening. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pause and give thanks that you, God, sit with us in our moments of pain and know what that is like. We pause and give thanks that you, God, have been present during this season of uncertainty and wilderness. We pause and give thanks that you, God, have given us glimpses of the kingdom of God in and through people and experiences over the last two years. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the darkness of the last two years, help us hold in tension the grief with the moments of light and hope that while so much of the world has changed, God, you have remained the same. We bring to you all of these prayers as well as the unspoken words on our lips and in our hearts. We offer these prayers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 We continue in worship through our giving, the giving of our gifts back to God, a portion of what God has given so generously to us. When you give, you literally impact the lives of those in this community and beyond. We continue to give to UMCOR um, on behalf, so that we can support relief efforts in Ukraine and um, through and support our churches, our United Methodist churches in Ukraine. We continue to give to disaster response across this nation and this world, and we continue to give to mission so that we might be the hands and feet of Christ in this city and beyond. There is so much need, and God uses you and me to meet this need through the giving back of the resources that God has shared with us. So you can give securely online, you can give through Cash App, you can give through text to give um, by uh, emailing the finance office, calling the church, mailing your gifts to the church, or using the blue baskets that are at the entrances and exits in the sanctuary today. God has been so good to us. Let us now be good to God as we praise God together.
Amen. You may be seated. Today, we continue in our Lenten season, Enough Already. And we'll focus on the theme that timing is everything. Turn in your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Luke, the 13th chapter, beginning in the 31st verse. You can also find the scripture in your bulletin on the screens if you're worshiping online um, or feel free to use your electronic devices. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35 in the New Revised Standard Version. Now I want you to know that Jesus has been at work. Um, You'll remember that Luke wants us to be laser focused on the fact that Jesus has come for the least, the last, and the lost, and to restore all of God's people to abundant life. Jesus has been healing the sick. He has been making the church leaders really mad. He has been making the the civic leaders, the government leaders, really irritated and scared because they don't know what he's going to do next. He is the telling the people over and over again in his words and in his action that there is more to life than this. Luke 31, 13, 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the next day, and on the third day, I will finish my work. Yet, today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets... And stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, here we are to worship. Here we are to bow down. Here we are to say that you are indeed our worthy and our holy God. So speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Speak and transform our hearts and our minds and our souls so that we might be the people you created us to be and we might live in the world you created us to live in. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Timing is everything. I don't think you heard me. Timing (laughs) is everything everything. I think sometimes we get to an enough already place in our lives because our timing is off. It's easy to get exasperated, to get overwhelmed, and to just get to a place where we're like, I can't take it anymore if our timing is off. 
If you think about it, I mean, if, if you really think about it, we get to that enough already place because things aren't going the way we want them to go, how we want them to go, when we want them to go. Timing is everything. God teaches us that our time is not God's time and God's time is not our time. That God sees time very differently than we see time. Spoiler alert. God doesn't care about daylight savings time. <clears throat> it, it, it would be okay with God if the clock didn't turn over once a year and didn't fall back once a year. It doesn't affect God in any way. We learn that our hour is like a millisecond in God's time. That we are just a blip on the radar in the timing of God. And yet we have made such a big deal about time. Everything runs by the clock. Everything runs by the season. Everything runs on a schedule that has been predetermined for us by some humans that decided that we needed a way to mark life together. God told us how to mark life together. When the sun is up, you do the work, and when the sun goes down, you rest. <laughs> but that's not what we do, right? So we encounter Jesus, and he's been at work. <laughs> Jesus has been healing people. He has been t touching people that the world has said we don't touch. He has been talking to people that society says we don't talk to. He has been challenging the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Remember, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are the leaders of the temple. They are the religious leaders of the time. And he has just downright gotten on their nerves. He's upset the apple cart. He's told them that their way of doing things and their time of doing things is just not quite right and there's a better way to do it. You know how we get when people bother our status quo. When somebody messes with our schedule. When somebody doesn't do things the way we want them to do them and when we want them to do them. <laughs> it's okay, you can say ouch. <laughs> the way that God marks time in the Bible is to pull it out for us, point it out for us. At that very hour, that means we need to stop and pay attention to the time. A at what very hour? See, if you go back in Luke chapter 13, you will find that Jesus has been teaching and he has said, okay, either you repent <laughs> or you perish. You keep doing what you're doing, the way you're doing it, how you're doing it, and you keep getting the same results. Or you can stop doing what you're doing and try doing it a different way, a way that is better for the whole of society, and you get to live. A lesson for us today. And then Jesus tells a parable about a barren fig tree. And, and we learn from that parable that if things don't bear good fruit in time, after you put in some work with it and you've given it the opportunity, the time to bear good fruit, if they don't do what they're supposed to do, you're supposed to cut it down. 
Hmm. Another hard lesson for us today. And then Jesus heals the bent over woman. The woman who had no business in the synagogue on the Sabbath because she was ill and sick people weren't supposed to come and make the synagogue sick. And the people of God were not supposed to be working or in Jesus' case, curing on the Sabbath. And then Jesus made them even matter by calling them hypocrites because they would untie their animals to feed them and give them something to drink, but they would not lift a finger to help a human. Hmm. Another ouch lesson? Then Jesus tells another parable about a mustard seed and then a parable about yeast. And then he talks about a narrow door. That the door to God, the door to heaven is narrow. And a whole lot of people who think they're going to heaven will be weeping and gnashing their teeth when they see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But they themselves are thrown out. Some who are last will be first and some who are first will be last. And at that very hour, <laughs> the Pharisees come. The teachers, the holders of the law, the holders of the religious law, those who would tell you that you have broken one of those 300 plus rules in Leviticus that you were supposed to have memorized and live your life by, who would hit your hand and punish you, who would make the rules about who was invited to the table and who was not invited to the table, the Pharisees who were supposed to have some connection to God through the Torah and lead the people in the way that leads to life eternal, the Pharisees who got angry with Jesus because Jesus was preaching about abundant life and it looked very differently from what the Pharisees had been telling the people all along. The Pharisees, the church leaders who tried to hold rules that excluded God's people and Jesus said, everybody's welcome. The Pharisees who made money off of people's illnesses. The Pharisees who had big business around who came in and who stayed out and how much you had to pay to be on the inside. At that time, that very hour, the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, leave here for Herod wants to kill you. Now, most of us would have said, all right, I'm out. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I like my life. I want to keep it. <laughs> no problem. I'm out of here. But Jesus had the opportunity and the benefit of understanding that God's way is not our way and our way is not God's way and that sometimes things are not as they appear and that timing is everything. What Jesus knew was several things. First, the Pharisees were the ones who wanted him gone. <laughs> Has anybody ever come to you and said, well, some people were talking. 
This never happens in church, y'all. Some people were talking and they're unhappy with a decision that you made and so stop it. (laughs) Well, who are those people? And how come they won't come talk to me? (laughs) This this would have been the anonymous notes of direction, right? (laughs) The, The notes that get put in the offering plate that say, well... The Pharisees wanted Jesus gone. And Jesus was aware of this because he was in tune and in step and on time with God. He also knew (laughs) that Herod had a weak ego. Now, this is not the same Herod that tried to kill him when he was a baby. This is his son, And his son is more of a figurehead than an actual leader because he is in the process of losing the throne because he is a terrible leader. Hmm. Hmm. So Jesus knows that the Pharisees want him gone. He knows that Herod doesn't really have any power anymore. He just talks a good game. And Jesus knows that he is on assignment from God. All of these three things add up to one thing, that timing matters. But see, we can get caught up in any of these things in our day-to-day lives if we are not walking closely with God. If you are out of step with God or if you are not listening with God or if you are not living with God, then you end up being out of time. And when you are out of time, you can be taken by any ruse of the enemy in your life. And when you are taken by a ruse of the enemy in your life, you end up outside of the will of God. And outside of the will of God, you cannot experience abundant life. And if you cannot experience abundant life, what's the point of living anyway? Preacher, why do we do Lent? (laughs) Because timing matters. Because when we get to a place of enough already, we are out of luck step with God. Let me say that again. When we get to a place where we are living in enough already, in exasperation, in overwhelming, in an overwhelming place, in a place where we're like, I cannot take it anymore, where one thing might be the thing that breaks the camel's back, what we have to understand is that we are outside of God's timing and outside of God's will because that is not abundant life. Hmm. 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 Get away from here. For Herod wants to kill you. Then Jesus. This is why I laugh every time I see these portraits of this meek and mild Jesus who looks like he wouldn't harm a hair on anybody's head. The Jesus that is the the lamb, you know, the sweet little Jesus. And this is also why my favorite Jesus is the Jesus who turns the table over in the temples because that's a more real representation of Jesus the Christ. He said to them, go and tell that fox for me. Hmm. So what we've learned in our biblical learning is that a fox is a sly animal. 
A fox comes in and out of its den, in and out of its hole at a, remember from last week, opportune time (laughs) in order to achieve its sly goal. (laughs) A fox exists to confuse you. A fox exists to catch you off guard. A fox in the Bible is an animal that exists to get you off track. And Jesus is calling this fox out and saying I know what you're up to I see the harm you intend for me and I raise you my father in heaven who has already told me what you're up to so you won't work here sassy Jesus says go and tell that fox for me listen I'm on a mission. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. I don't have time for you. And on the third day, (laughs) I will finish my work. Other translations say, on the third day, I will reach my goal. On the third day, I will do what I was sent to do. So you who have plans to distract me, don't worry about your plans because I'm clear on the assignment and the timeline. I have three days to do my work. Three days to heal the dead, to heal the the sick. Three days to perform cures three days to continue the work of God and helping the people understand that there is more to life than this that God loves you God cares for you God wants to bring you in and bring you home that God wants to protect you so get out of my way your plan won't work I wonder what would happen if we talked to our situations and lives like that. (laughs) Today and tomorrow and the next day I have plans. I'm on assignment from God. So get thee behind me, Satan, in the name of Jesus. But you can't talk to your situations in life like that until you're clear about your plan and you understand that timing. Hmm. is everything. He continues, today, tomorrow, and the next day, in a new international version, it says, in any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Here's what you have to understand. This is part of why the Pharisees were mad at Jesus. They thought that all the prophets were dead. They didn't hear me, Jay. They don't, they, don't, they don't understand that the, the prophets are those that speak life <laughs> into death. That they don't, they, we, 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 must, we, we must understand that it is the prophets that speak hope into hopeless situations. We have to understand that it is the prophets that speak possibility into impossibility. It is the prophets that exist to teach us and remind us that there is always hope. That where you see darkness, there is always light. That where Where you see an end, God has just put a comma that when life is overwhelming and you're living in the land of enough already, it is the prophets who remind you that enough is not the end of the story because God is God and God is God all by God's self. And if we'll just move in step in God's time, then we don't have to live. (laughs) 
They haven't had the week I've had. Whew, this is good news today, y'all. Today is the Episcopal presiding bishop, Bishop Michael B. Curry. It's his birthday. You know, the prophet who gave us the royal wedding sermon called The Way of Love. The prophet who is helping us to reimagine what it means to live in love with each other and with God each and every day. It's his birthday, but before he was the presiding bishop, he was a preacher and a pastor who wrote this about the scripture for today. In the gospel for the second Sunday in Lent, Jesus speaks in tones of abject disappointment and utter heartbreak at the refusal of his own people to hear and heed the summons of God to draw near, to gather, and to come home. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He writes, for Jesus, God's passionate dream, compassionate desire, and bold determination is to gather God's human children closer and closer in God's embrace and love. You see, what Jesus is trying to teach us today is that if we will lean in to God's timing, there we will find peace. If we will lean into God's timing and where God wants us to be and how God wants us to live, it will feel like God is gathering us up under God's wings, bringing us home and holding us tight. And there we will find love. We will find relief and release, we will find rest, and we will find joy. So, so we can be like the Pharisees and the Israelites, and we can just do it our way. And we can continue to live in a place of enough already. Hmm. Or we can come home. We can draw near to God. And we can live in peace. Jesus kept working. He kept healing. He kept curing. He kept preaching. He kept teaching. And he left them where they were. They didn't have enough foresight or enough sense to follow Jesus where Jesus was going. He left them where they were because that's where they wanted to be. They wanted to be in their comfortable place. They wanted to be in their familiar place. They wanted to do things the way they had always done them. And so they stayed in chaos 
and death. And they did not see Jesus again. (laughs) Until what we call Palm Sunday. You remember all the bystanders? (laughs) All the opportunists? All the ones who wanted to be a part of the crowd. Timing it just right so that they could get their space at the parade. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. But I'm here to tell you today the good news. You don't have to wait. Timing is everything. It's your choice. Follow Jesus now. Walk with Jesus now. Live with Jesus now. Draw near to God now. Carve the time out so that you can hear the voice of God now. Abundant life now. Or say in Jerusalem, where they killed the prophets, stone those who are sent to give them hope. Or follow the Jesus who has come to bring those who are cast out. Raise those who are beaten down. Bring yourself to the heart of God. Timing is everything. It's your choice. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll continue this next week. Don't forget that it is incredibly important for you to worship in person if you are able. This coming Sunday, you will not want to miss worshiping in this place and getting to worship with our special guests next week. We will continue the series enough already and we'll dig deeper into where and how we live so that we can move from enough already to more than enough. Come on choir, please stand as you receive this benediction. Go from this place but not from the presence of the Most High God. Go from this place, but not from the peace that passes all understanding. Go from this place, but not from the joy that is our strength. Go from this place, but not from the abundant life that God has promised. Go and share the good news. Go and share that Jesus is here and now and that timing (laughs) is everything. So let the church say amen.